and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right, everybody, this is Brother Frank. Welcome back to another episode of The Remnant Call. And I'm excited because I've got back my friend, um, more than a friend, because when you know Jesus, when the Lord is in between a relationship between two people, it makes it extra special because there's more of a bond. It's not just something that's superficial on this earth, but it's something eternal, knowing that this moment here that we have as friends can go on forever because we have something in common, and that's Jesus, our Heavenly Father. And, and I want to be so thankful to know David Murray as friend, um, friend in Christ Jesus, friend in Yeshua. And, and he just uh, is such a blessing, and we're glad to have him back on tonight. This is going to be Deeper Communion Part 2, Understanding His Government. And if you didn't hear two weeks ago, Deeper Communion Part 1, uh, A Time of Healing, and um, you need to go back and hear that one also because David's building something here, um, something that's going to lead to not just this uh, knowing of a fear of the end times, like something's going, and, and trust me, you need to be awake and, and aware of this, but it's going to bring you into that deep communion to where you have a confidence moving forward that no matter what happens, God is still faithful. And, uh, you know, I'm so often when I think that I have something really in check in my walk with God, I realize that I have a lot more to learn. And I thank the Lord for his grace and being patient with me. One more message. If you didn't hear last week's message, also, Brother Benjamin, on Jeremiah 29, The Visit, go and listen to that. Another powerful message by Brother Benjamin. Uh, two good friends, back-to-back. -back. I'm so thankful. I'm not going to waste your time anymore. I'm going to bring on Brother David here with us tonight. All right. I'm here, David, Frank. Sorry. How you doing, brother? Okay, amen, amen. Sorry about that. I'm just not blessed less to have you on here tonight. I know the audience is. Um, David, I feel that this, it, this is coming back to Christianity 101. I, I feel like what you're trying to get in, it's deep, but it's the foundational stuff. It, 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 and if we, kind of, if we miss this, yet we get all the knowledge of everything else, we've kind of missed the real the real meat of the whole issue. And, and David, I feel that's where you're going with this deeper communion series. What is the Lord laying on right now uh, and taking us in tonight on understanding his government? Uh, well, well, first of all, thank you, Frank, for, for the introduction. And it's an, it's an honor to be called your friend and a brother in the Lord. And, and the reason why I, I want to take a minute to, to address that is because Brothers and sisters, for, for those of you that are tuning in and listening, whether it's now, whether it's after the fact, uh, you know, one of the things that, that Father is doing in this hour is he is returning the church back to his heart. There's a calling that's gone out. Um, all things start in the spirit realm. Things do not start in the natural realm. And then from the natural realm with our natural senses and natural understanding, we attempt to engage the kingdom. That's backwards. We live as spirit beings. We are spirit beings, right? It's our spirit man that's been reconciled back to God through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We have been made alive in our spirit. And we have a soul which consists of our mind, will, and emotions, and we're housed in this physical temple, right? So that's 101, going back to, to 101 Christianity, you know, uh, our understanding our beliefs, we have to begin to walk out 
what we say we know in practice, in application. And fellowship, brothers and sisters, you know, that we can draw upon one another are going to be a huge blessing in this hour. We were never called to be alone. And sometimes that we go through seasons of that. We will see that in the Word of God where there are seasons when someone was alone. But it is never God's ordained plan because the body of Christ, the Scriptures say, are, are jointly and, and intricately, finely knit together. And when one part of the body grieves, we all grieve. That is Scripture. And it is a blessing and an honor to have a brother and sister or brother or sister that we can lean to. And so just to address that, bring that back full circle, Frank, thank you for your friendship and, and for your um, oneness in spirit because it's a tremendous blessing and encouragement to me. So thank well, you. Brother, I, I am honored and um, I just really appreciate you. And, and uh, I do, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, really hearing uh, these messages uh, uh, that you have uh, brought through it. And, and David, you know, as uh, we've talked off air a lot, um, you know, my personal um, feeling towards uh, the teachings that you've had, especially on communion, understanding the value, who we are in Jesus. It's been, you know, how important that's been to me. Um, but I'm going to ask before we go any farther, David, could we just open up with a word of prayer and, and just ask, uh, God, to just bless this show. And I'm going to ask if you'd pray for us tonight. Amen. Father God, I thank you that your nature was revealed through the earth ministry of your son. I thank you that we have a written record of the nature of your heart as expressed through the perfect expression of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that as we dig into your word, as we return to being students of the word, Lord God, that we return to your heart. I thank you for your faithfulness and your loving kindness that you are drawing the body of Christ back to yourself. Lord, in all the areas where we have agreed with the lies of Satan, because we simply have not known any better, I thank you for your illumination, for your revelation knowledge, for truth impartations being shed abroad, that we would have greater revelation of who we are as your children and a more clear understanding of who you are. Lord, I thank you that as we embrace the word tonight and in the weeks to come and in our just day-to-day interactions, Lord God, that we place every memory, every pain, every hurt, every lie, every deception, every false accusation, and every interaction that contradicted your nature, that contradicted your truth, that wounded us and made us afraid to embrace your goodness. I thank you for that healing balm being applied tonight, Lord God, being applied moment by moment as we take the courage to partner with the Holy Spirit in this time, in this generation, that we would begin to walk in the fullness of Christ that we were ordained to. We thank you for the blessing and the privilege to be able to speak freely in a free land. I thank you for the honor and the blessing that we have been given the ability to freely share the gospel in the United States while right now our brothers and sisters are being tortured and killed for sharing the gospel. I thank you for the grace and the mercy in this hour to freely hear your word. Thank you that this time will not fall to the ground, Lord God, that we would, we would cap- capture that time and seize it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I once heard, David, that the bigger your God is, the greater the shadow and uh, I feel like that's where you've been trying to take us, underneath the shadow of his wings. And so with that, please let us know what the Lord's been laying on your heart. So what we've been talking about, guys, um, and frankly, you and I, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we talked about this all, you know, offline a lot. There, in every season, the Lord desires for his children to walk into agreement with his heart. 
And, you know, in the, in the, the weeks and months to come, Lord willing, we're going to discuss the different ways in which the Holy Spirit moves and is designed to move and the privilege and honor of having our, the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, live within our spirit man. No other covenant gave that as a covenant right. And, and so there is a right and a privilege that for, for many of us are being squandered because we're not embracing it. We're not teaching it. We're not understanding it. We're not grabbing hold of it. What's, what we grab hold of in its place is the lies and fears of Satan. And the scriptures say that perfect love casts out all fear. It does not say that perfect love casts out all fear except in Christ's return. It does not say that perfect love casts out all fear except during the, the, the end times. It doesn't say that. There is no provision for fear. There is no provision for despair. Those are byproducts of a belief system. And the belief system that the church has, has, has adopted in many ways runs contrary to the nature of God and by extension how the kingdom of God wants and is meant to operate through the cooperation of the church. And what Father is doing in this hour is he's beginning a call to begin inviting the church of the living God that houses the spirit of the living God inside each individual temple to begin to stand up and take their spiritual birthplace. And for for everyone hearing this, you're born in this dispensation, this time in history. And this time in history, every single child of God that's born in every single station of history had a call, a purpose, had a destiny. There are no spectators in the body of Christ. There never were, there was never meant to be, there never will be. And for those of us living in this generation, we are called as ambassadors to advance the kingdom of God according to what's on his heart. The the first century church began that, and they were off the scene by, you know, around 100 AD, and they passed that torch through teaching and discipleship to the next generation. And we are in a time where much teaching and discipleship has replaced with fear and anxiety. And in Father's love, he is inviting us to enter into deep intimacy with him, which is why he reconciled us. So this series that we're going to be doing, Deeper Communion, um, last week we spoke a little bit more of an introduction, and we're going to be getting on understanding his government. Because, guys, we cannot really engage in intimacy or let me say it this way, the degree in which we engage God is going to be affected by the degree in which we understand his nature. If we have a perception of God that is twisted or inaccurate because of our own past hurts, pains, fears, woundings, as we attempt to enter into greater communion, greater intimacy, knowing him more, those fears and lies will twist and pervert and shackle us and, and, and hinder us from entering into what we are called to enter into as children of God. And so what I want to start with is, in, in this week is understanding his government. And what we're going to look at, understanding his government, you know, when we talk about the kingdom of God, Jesus spent three and a half years discussing the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. He mentioned the kingdom a lot. And but, but we, we kind of tend to just gloss over it. We think that, you know, when Jesus returns, it's just going to be this kind of big, you know, uh, you know lawless type of interaction. For many of us, we haven't really stopped to even think, well, what does that look like? What will the thousand-year reign look like? When Jesus fulfills the prophetic utterances that he spoke through his own children to the prophets and said he's going to come back and reign and return, and that those of us that have been prepared and equipped are going to rule and reign with him, well, what does that even look like? And for many of us, we scratch our heads and say, I don't know. I, I haven't even really thought getting, just, <laughs> just getting past the fear and the nail-biting that I'm living in right now. But see, if, if we don't begin to engage or think, what, what is the kingdom of heaven? What does it look like? What is it about? 
um, the more that we begin to meditate on that, the more that we can begin to interact according to our citizenship. Ephesians 1, 3 says we've been made citizens of heaven. Present tense. Present tense. We are spirit beings that house the kingdom of God. Present tense. And so if we are receiving input from the natural realm, from our five physical senses, more than we are receiving the input of the kingdom that lives in us, we have a big problem. And they, let me stop right there. That problem is not condemning in the Lord's eyes. All condemnation has been atoned for on the cross. That there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no sense of disappointment in Father's eyes. There's no sense that we haven't measured up to his standard because the standard was accomplished with the blood of Jesus. We've been made the righteousness Amen. of Christ, Colossians 1.21. So, so, and the reason why I'm, I'm stepping back and laying that foundation, and I'm going to be a broken record here, guys, is because we must embrace who he made us through the blood of Jesus Christ if we hope to engage with any degree of accuracy his heart, his intentions, his mind, his will. The reason why the body of Christ is in so much confusion and backbiting is that we f- we're fulfilling the prophecy Jesus spoken about where in the end times the love of many will grow cold. The only people that have the love of God is the church through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And for many of us, the love of the church has grown cold and it's because we don't know any better. So for us to understand his government, well, how does, that, how does that increase intimacy? Three ways, guys. Understanding his government begins with understanding the nature of God. Once we understand the nature of God, we begin to dig into his nature. We'll begin to realize we need to understand the kingdom of heaven is an extension of his nature. So right there we can see to the degree in which we meditate on the kingdom and what we think and how we think this will play out will go back to who we believe the nature of God is. So if we want to have intimacy, if we want to engage the Lord in his kingdom, if we want to engage the kingdom of God that's inside our spirit man, it starts by understanding the nature of God. The questions that a lot of Christians are hearing or or, or that I'm hearing a lot of Christians ask me in this hour is, is there more to this Christian life? There has to be more, David. What am I missing? I'm trying to do everything right. Something's missing. Is there life beyond the despair and brokenness? What I hear many people, a lot of the feedback that I get, emails and, and, and the correspondences I get is I don't understand it. The scriptures say that, that he takes the brokenhearted and he takes the, those in despair and he, he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So why am I, as a born-again, spirit-filled believer, experiencing the same despair and brokenness I did before I accepted Christ? And, and these are from Christians who have been walking with the Lord 10, 20, 30 years. Is there more to the Christian life than just dying to the old man? Is there more than just rejecting the quote-unquote religious system? For many of us, okay, the Holy Spirit has gotten our attention, it's pricked our spirit, our souls, right? Our mind, will, emotions have responded to the initial call. We understand that we're meant to call out of our religious institutional system, and we're meant to enter into something. But those of us that, that have rejected the institutional system, what have we entered into? We either are entering into his kingdom or we're just changing venue. There's no gray. We either operate in his kingdom according to his kingdom laws or we're living outside the kingdom as lawbreakers. Satan does not care what the outer wrapping that looks like. And God doesn't care. God cares about one thing, intimacy. He died for reconciliation, and after reconciliation comes intimacy. That's what's on his heart. So the way we start with that, guys, is to ask ourselves, where is our joy? 
Where's our rest? Above all, guys, what we need to begin asking, what is on Father's heart, what he is asking his children in this hour is where is our love? Where is his love that's supposed to be moving violently within us? Where is it? A response I will often get is, yeah, but David, we live in such terrible dark times. And my response to that is, the scriptures do not make provision for that line of thinking. We in the United States here are not living in darker times in terms of our way of life than the first century was living when they were being fed to lions, literally. When Nero had a commission, when, when he, in my opinion, Nero uh, was demon-possessed, and he reigned from approximately 64 to 68 AD, uh, he's one who it, tradition accredits to martyring Peter and Paul. If you, we were to study just the first 300 years of church history, they completely eclipse many of the modern persecutions going around in the world today. And parts of Africa, and the continent of Africa right now, people are being burned alive, entire villages for being born-again Christians. And in, the, in the sections of the world, sections of China, Korea, uh, Korea, areas of Sri Lanka, you have the Ivory Coast, you have Tunisia. You, there's, there's persecution going on over this world right now today um, that is horrendous, that doesn't eclipse what the first century church went through and that we here in the United States have never even, we haven't even faced it. We don't even know what it is. For many of us, we're, we're, <laughs> we're so afraid and scared at the, the way somebody looks at us or what the newspapers say. We're so afraid of, of, for some of us, our political representatives that, that we, we haven't even asked, Lord, what's on your heart in this hour? When was the last time we prayed for the persecuted church? And see, guys, again, again, let me back up. There's no condemnation in this, none whatsoever. This is a result of, of us not understanding his nature, and he's calling us to begin to return. These are questions not to cause shame or condemnation in any way. They're questions to get us to be shaken from our thinking. So our thinking, the foundations of our beliefs can begin coming into alignment. Corinthians thirteen thirteen. Now we're gonna we're gonna move kind of fast, guys. The benefit of having this recorded, I, I would if any of this pricks upon your heart, we're gonna move through these scriptures in context. All right, Deuteronomy eighteen, uh, two Timothy one um, says, "In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established." And so we're gonna look at these scriptures in context. And I invite you to take all these back to the Lord to to. See if it bears witness with your spirit with what God is doing and is calling prophetically his church into in this generation, this hour. Corinthians 13, 13 says, Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Before we come in to understand his kingdom and how it operates, we have to understand the kingdom of God was created by God and it's an extension of his very nature. So what is God's nature? Understanding his nature is going to determine how well we can operate with him and cooperate with him and enter into greater intimacy. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. Guys, please understand this. When Satan comes in to distort, and he does, he will distort every scripture. Jesus did not reject the scriptures that Satan threw at him. Jesus answered twisted doctrines with accurate perception of who Father God is. He, create, he, he corrected false doctrine. He addressed false doctrine by answering according to the nature of God. That is vital to understand what took place in the desert that day, guys. What the church does is whenever Satan twists doctrine, twists scripture, we throw out the scripture until we're left with nothing. There's not much meat of the word left in the body of Christ. We have rejected everything that Satan tries to counterfeit. So um, we, can, we can see how that just, it's, it's not wise. We don't do that. 
The word is ours. The Bible is given to the, the saints. We don't throw out the doctrines because Satan tries to take a doctrine and twist it. We just stay true to the intent and the nature of that doctrine according to the nature of God. So what does this have to do with love? Well, because what we hear is two sides of the camp. Well, God is love, yes, but God is holy. Guys, there's no but in there. There is no but. God is not schizophrenic. God is love. Holiness is one of many expressions of love. There is no contradiction in that. We need to reconcile that. Typically, we have two camps that just talk about love and certain aspects of how that's manifested. Or we discuss holiness as if it is contrary to love. And so we have to balance out holiness with love. Because that is false doctrine. It's error. God is love, and, and love is expressed like a multifaceted diamond that will reflect light differently. The nature of God, love, will reflect differently during different seasons, different times, different days, what we're going through. Uh, judgment, joy, mercy, discipleship, correction, exhortation, all of these are expressions of love. The scriptures say he chastens those whom he loves. So when we say, yeah, well, God is love, but, you know, but yeah, he, let's not forget he's holy. Guys, that is because we completely do not understand what holiness is. Holiness is, is, is to be in the same nature of God. That's the definition of holiness, to be in like kind with God. So the more we embrace who he is, the more we will conform into his image. And in his image, there is no sin. The more that we embrace who he is, the more it changes us from the inside out, the less we will be drawn to the things of this world that contradict his nature. We don't need to focus on trying to attempt to be holy. That's just going to create a Pharisee. This generation with the spirit of Pharisee and the spirit of Antichrist is running rampant in the church. Rampant. Because when we came out of institutionalism, we never entered into the kingdom. And so we're just creating a new form of self-righteousness. He's tearing all that down, guys. It's good news. No condemnation. It's fantastic news. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, all right, we just talked about faith, hope, and love. Let's break that down. Talking about the nature of God, God is love. The word faith means to have a personal trust in something. That's what faith is. It means to believe. And the Greek word for believe means to have a personal trust. That word hope means a confident expectation of things to come. And the word love is a verb. It is the very nature and essence of who God is. So let's reread that with proper Greek um, understanding. Now, these three remain personal trust in the Lord, a confident expectation in him, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, remember the context of 1 Corinthians 13, guys, is an entire chapter where Paul went on to explain it does not matter what we do or don't do. If we are not immersed and flowing in love, it means nothing. Because oneness with God is to enter into oneness with his nature. Oneness with his nature is love. Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything except you love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not enemy. It keeps no record of wrongs. Major conviction in the body of Christ in this hour. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Do everything in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. If I have the gift of prophecy... I have faith to move mountains, but I have love. I have nothing. A lot of prophecy being spoken this hour, guys. How much of it is love? How much of it is pointing us back to deeper intimacy with the Lord? That doesn't necessarily mean we reject the word, guys. Please hear me. That requires maturity. We're going to get into prophecy again in the weeks to come. We're going to talk about new covenant prophecy 
Prophecy is to understand the heart, mind, and intention of God. It's very simple. We've mystified it. We've made a mess of it. We're going to clear that up, guys. It's going to bring a lot of you guys peace and understanding of, of who you are as a spiritual believer and how prophecy is meant to serve you and be a blessing. Song of Solomon 8-7, many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Let's go back to context, guys. Song of Solomon is a type and shadow of Jesus and the bridegroom. Excuse me, the bride. Jesus as the bridegroom and the bride. The Song of Solomon is a picture of what we have in the New Covenant. And in the Song of Solomon... It's placing love above all things in this earth. Okay, we're discussing the nature of God. Psalm 143.8, Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for you I entrust with my life. Proverbs 3.3, 3, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely upon the love of God that he has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Ephesians 4, 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Song of Solomon 4, 9, you have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart at one glance with your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. That is a manifestation and expression of love. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how we may spurn one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. In John 4:12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Romans 12:10, be devoted to one another. In love, honor one another above yourselves. Ephesians 5.21, to submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Right, let me ask you this. Why would submitting to one another be showing reverence to Christ? Because Jesus is love manifested. And showing reverence is showing the nature of Christ, which is love. Ephesians 4.32, we're going to finish up here, guys. I could go on for hours, hours. I could go on for hours. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. 1 Peter 3.7, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Treat her as you should that your prayers will be not hindered. Many of us, we ask, why are my prayers going unanswered? 1 Peter 3, 7 makes it clear. If we're not moving in love and honor, it hinders our prayers. Cross-reference that with James chapter 2. That if our motives are off, we're violating the kingdom of God. He cannot violate his nature. Guys, we can go on about how um, not just God is love, but the greatest picture, the manifest expression of our relationship with God is the marriage covenant. And we're not going to get into it now. We don't have time. But the marriage covenant is the greatest earthly expression of how we're meant to interact with him. Colossians 3.14, above all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Ephesians 4, 2, and 3, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, guys, I'm, I'm going to – I have more scriptures, but um, we need to move on. 
I want us to understand that we are, God is love. Holiness, discipline, correction, judgment of sin are manifest expressions of his mercy and his love. When we discipline, hopefully, our own children, because we don't want to see them do something to harm themselves, we should be doing it in love, not in wrath and anger. But if we're doing it in love, if our child goes to stick his finger into a, into a utility socket, electrical socket, and we, we swat their hand in love, we've disciplined our child because they're about to engage in something that's harmful. Are we violating the law of love or are we enforcing it? Was that discipline a, a schizophrenic act contrary to love or was that love manifested in a particular time and season that will produce the greatest life of the kingdom for that child? Right, guys? Guys, we can dare to... to be encouraged by these things. We can embrace these things. It's okay. God will not let you down. Many of us have given up on wanting to believe that God is an all-loving God and we've turned to him being a wrathful God and we've contorted what holiness is. We've contorted the purpose of judgments. We've contorted his heart in his return because we're afraid to believe he is love and that he loves us so much that all the things people said about us are lies. Guys, I want to tell you tonight and encourage you, and I'm I'm going to continue this as we go through this deeper communion series, this deeper intimacy, intimacy series. As we have entered into his death, burial, and resurrection, we are in Christ Jesus now. John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one just as you and I are one. Now, I'm a stickler for the word. I'm a stickler for dispensations. Holy Spirit wasn't given at that time. But Jesus prophesied that night to them, right, that they would receive the Holy Spirit, that they were going to receive power from on high. They were going to receive the Holy Spirit. And so the type and shadow of what was to come, when Jesus Jesus was one with them in his earthly ministry. As he came, he said, I won't leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to live in you. And so what Jesus was teaching them that night, just before his departure, is me and my heavenly father are one, and you guys are going to be one in us. It will be granted once I take the atonement of all the sins for all mankind, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Romans 5.5 5, says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Colossians 3.13 says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Their work will be shown for that day because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Now, guys, if you look at the context of that scripture, Colossians 3 is addressing the reward seat of born-again Christians, the testing of fire. Guys, one thing we have to understand about the kingdom of God is fire purifies. We've been taught, whenever you hear of fire, think of hell, think of fear and condemnation, judgment. The, the condemnation of sin has been atoned for on the cross. Fire in the believer's life is for purification. Fire refines us. We should be asking for the fire of God because it's love manifested through intense heat that burns up lies. That is the purpose of the refiner's fire. That is the purpose of shaking that goes on in our life. It is love manifested in a way that delivers us from fears and bondage. But it starts, guys, with understanding God is love and that we are one with him. We had been baptized not just into his death and burial, into his life, into his goodness, into his joy. How many times do the scriptures talk about the joy of the Lord, the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit? Guys, these are good things. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is never going to end. It's a joyful kingdom. Guys, we're going to be held accountable, not to the outer actions that we did, but the motive of our heart. John 
for 1 John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You know, David, so, can I say something really quick? Sure, Frank, absolutely. Hey, it, it, just before you go too far past this, talking about the fire and the refining, and, and, I, and I don't want to throw you off, but there's something just comes to my mind when you're talking about that. You know, when the three men went into the fiery furnace, you know, they were bound up with ropes and tied up, you know, with bondage basically of this world. And, and when they came out of the fire, the only thing that was burned off of them was the bondage and the ropes and the chains of this world. And, and I agree, right? that fire frees us from the bondage. They went in, uh, you know, unable to walk correctly. They came out freely. I just wanted to interject that because I just was thinking about it as you mentioned that. No, amen, Frank. That is a wonderful type and shadow of the refiner's fire. Absolutely. That is a perfect, <laughs> a perfect expression of the principle that, that uh, I'm trying to, to share. Thank you, Frank. That's awesome. Uh, guys, here's something that I want to I, I uh, let. If we look at the earth ministry of Jesus, right, he spent – three and a half years sharing about the kingdom. And in fact, he spent over 40 days discussing things of the kingdom after his resurrection before he went to heaven. I just don't realize that. It's an often overlooked portion of, uh, of scripture. That after Jesus was resurrected and he went and visited the apostles, it said he stayed with them over a month and discussed with them the things of the kingdom. He explained the kingdom of God. It still took Peter almost 15 years to get it, that salvation was for everyone. Peter still didn't get it. It was progressive revelation the church had to get. And it took a Pharisee who was knocked down and blinded to have the greatest revelation of the love and nature of God. And he even corrected Peter. To Peter, you're beginning to stray from the love of God. You're beginning to alienate and reject other brothers and sisters in the body. Right? Galatians chapter 2. So guys, when, when we're talking about government, right, the word government can be defined as the direction and control exercised over the actions of the members, citizens, or inhabitants, or communities. That's government. So when we understand that his government is expressed and carried out through his nature, we begin to have a picture of, wow, his government is ruled by love. His government is governed through his nature. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Now listen to this next part, guys. We hear this all the time, right? We, 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 it's, it's a scripture that we're familiar with, it, but really, it, let it sink in. The government will be, will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The kingdom of God resides inside of us. Where is the Prince of Peace in relation to our walk? If we're devoid of peace, that means we are walking outside of the law of love. We are not walking as citizens of heaven. We're, we're walking as lawbreakers in that area. Now, again, guys, please hear me. Every sin has been atoned for. Colossians 1.21, 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, Hebrews 10.10, 10, we're made holy and blameless and righteous in his eyes. This is not about self-righteous works. This is about understanding he loves us, he's forgiven us, he's made us citizens of heaven. The power of the kingdom and the nature of the kingdom resides inside of us. Guys, as we begin to meditate on that, the natural byproduct is we will begin encountering the realm of the spirit. We will begin interacting with the realm of the spirit, which is normal Christianity. We are meant to have conversations with God that are consistent with his nature. They will never violate scripture. We are meant to know, think, see, feel, dialogue with him. 
in the first century church, in, in, in Acts, it says that be careful who, who you're with because some of you have entertained angels without knowing it. And angelic interactions were not something the apostles sought after. They recognized it was a natural byproduct of interacting with ministering spirits that are sent to serve those who inherit the kingdom of God. That's what the scripture says. Angels are ministering spirits meant to serve those who have inherited the kingdom of God. So, so many times when we feel like we're alone, we feel like we don't have answers, we have, we're in confusion. Because the reason why it is is because we are not living as citizens of God's government. We're living outside the law of love, which is with all his kingdom and the rulership, the exercising of that kingdom, the enforcing of that kingdom is governed by is love. In whatever area in our lives, guys, we are not walking in love. We are in violation of the kingdom of heaven. And there is no fruit of life that will come from that. That's a dead tree. So the law of love, guys, and we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. We'll start winding this home because we're going to get into application. We could talk about this, and we're going to. We're going we're gonna to dig into different forms of intimacy. It starts with love and understanding everything of his kingdom. It's a real kingdom. They were real citizens. We are heirs to the throne. Heaven is not this big, gray, misty cloud. It's a government. He's going to exercise that government. It will manifest for a thousand years on this earth. There will be things to do, guys. There's things to do now. Every guy said you wonder, you, you, you hear these wonderful, legitimate encounters and interactions, and we think, oh, Lord, I would just love to, to interact with you. One, many of us are, without, without getting too deep of a rabbit trail, many of us want spiritual encounters because we think it means it will show God loves us. Guys, that is a, that is a lie from the pit of hell. We do not engage in spiritual encounters to validate our self-worth. Spiritual encounters are the natural byproduct of children that have accepted they made the righteous of Christ. They're never to validate. Our self-worth doesn't come from our gifts, callings, or divine interactions. Nor does our self-worth come from living a self-righteous life and rejecting everything of the kingdom. Both are lies. But if we want to begin to move in greater intimacy, we have to begin to embrace the law of love. Our citizenship is in heaven, and heaven is governed by love. John 5, 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I, t- I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. Jesus was walking out the kingdom of heaven on earth. Matthew six ten. this then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed or hallowed or holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What Jesus was beginning to introduce to them is the reality and the understanding that what Father wants to do in heaven, we're to do on earth. Again, we took that and allowed Satan to pervert that passage and say, it's, it's a passive prayer. No, it's not a passive prayer at all. Jesus is saying, guys, you're to be praying the way I do in, in, right now in my earth ministry. I told you I only do what I see my Father doing. Here's a, here's a principle prayer. Here's a formula. I want you to get the, the principle behind it. Is Father, whatever your will is, it's going on in heaven, that should manifest here on earth. Now, the excessiveness of that, like anything else, everything has a false doctrine. The, uh, the, the NAR movement, the Kingdom Dominion Now movement, um, you know, the new apostolic reformation, these, some of these are perversions of the reality that we have been granted citizenship of, an earth, of a heavenly kingdom because we must stop rejecting the truth because someone is speaking lies. The word of faith movement, right? Think about that. We, we disparage the word of faith as if faith is not what pleases God, justifies us by faith, and is the only thing the scriptures say that anything done apart from faith is sin. By grace you have been saved through faith, Ephesians 2.8. Right? When the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on the earth? But we go around saying the word of faith movement as if faith is now a sin. 
No, we need to recognize, guys, is that what was started off when the Holy Spirit began to move in the 1900s and wanted to teach that generation about how to cooperate with the kingdom, we do so by personal trust. That's the word of faith. That's what faith means. And Satan got a hold of it, twisted our hearts, and it became about just claiming it, naming it, all that stuff for self-centered living. Okay, so you reject that and you hold on to the principle. The kingdom is apprehended by faith. Like Corinthians 13.13 uh, 13 says, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. Without faith, guys, we can't engage anything. This teaching is meaningless if you don't apply it. It is applied through personal belief. That is faith. So, guys, you know, without, again, dovetailing too much, but going back to the kingdom and understanding the kingdom is in love, we grasp it through our belief system. We need to stop allowing Satan to rob us of the kingdom because excessiveness is, t- is taught. Paul had the discernment. To him, it was common sense. Paul fluffed it off. He said, some of you preach the gospel for right motive, some of you for, for your own personal gain. But either way, the gospel is being preached, so that's good. There's, people say that today. That, that false teacher. <laughs> uh, so I laugh, guys, because God has a sense of humor, and God is not looking to club us. He loved us so much he died while we were covered in the very filth that he could not even have in his presence. He loves you, and he's got a sense of humor, and he wants everyone to escape hell, and he gave the power of the church to do it. Just put some things in perspective there. So how do we round this up, guys? How do we begin entering into intimacy through understanding his government? Um, is we need to look at our belief system. What are the beliefs motivating our thinking? For many of us, guys, we have to be honest and say it's not love at all. It's about anger and hurt and pain. When we talk about the Lord's return, how many of us feel a sense of self-righteous, like, payback? I've been wrong, Lord, and let me just dig up some, some you know, old covenant scriptures that uh, will justify my own anger and hurt and unforgiveness. I know that's an outro, guys, right? But there's no condemnation in Christ. This is about intimacy. We can't have intimacy until we've repented of some things. Repent means a change of direction. It's a verb. It's an action word. The first error he is calling the church to repent of is not, is not our outward actions. It's not of drugs and drinking. It's not our outward actions. It's our thinking. Proverbs 23, 7 is a man, 20, 27, 26. It's in Proverbs 23. As a man thinks within himself, so he is. Every chapter, every book in the Bible, the central theme of it is God is addressing in some form or another how we're thinking. The Bible is progressively revealing his nature. It's progressively getting us to change our thinking. It culminated at the cross. It is expressed with the kingdom of God now living inside of us. Everything we read and see and hear of his voice needs to be filtered through in love. If there's not love there, we need to ask him, Lord, what wounds do I still have? What areas am I looking to the approval of man? What areas have I looked at the rejection of man to determine my self-worth? What areas in my walk with you have I tried to bolster my own sense of self-worth through my own actions as if, guys, we can become more presentable in his eyes. As we have been made the righteousness of Christ through the accomplished work on the cross, there is not a thing we can do to be more holy in his eyes. The blood does it all. What he wants for us then, well, David, that's a contradiction. Hold on, David. You just said we're holy and blameless now, but you're talking about intimacy. Guys, There's positional and relational righteousness. Positionally, how we stand before a holy and perfect, loving God is blameless. We cannot enter into his presence with sin. We either can or we can't. And the scriptures say we can't. That's why Jesus died. So when we are presented before him, when we speak to him, 
When we talk to him, he sees us always eternally through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's our position. We are redeemed sons of God. We've been made, given robes of righteousness and garments of salvation. Now, relationally is what I'm talking about. He gave us positional righteousness so that we would dare to have the courage to live, relate to him the way he sees us. If I choose to think as if I'm God's a wrathful, angry God, and I just need to earn his love and acceptance, or my self-worth is going to come from something other than what he did on the cross, we're in error. Our belief system needs to change. And so this is where it starts, guys. We'll, we'll finish up. Right here, I'm going to give you just some, some things to think about. When you get alone with God, ask him, give him permission. Lord, what do you want to speak to me about right now? What do I truly believe about you? Show me areas. Speak to me in dream, in vision, in the word, through the confirmation of teaching. Speak to me however you like, Lord. Speak to me about what areas if I chose to believe about myself and you that violate your word. Because John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Guys, many of us, our prayers are going unanswered because his word does not abide in us. We are choosing to hold on to lies. We are choosing to think we can earn his love so we can earn a degree of holiness. And there's no intimacy in that. The scriptures say he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the pride. Pride, guys, is anything in which we attempt to find self-worth apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. It's already accomplished. Sorry, guys. I know for many of us that's like a mind blower. Humility is to walk in truth about what he says. And I've given this expression a lot. We'll close out here uh, in just a second. I've given this expression a lot. I want you guys to consider, consider in belief systems, right? Does the rejection of others cause us pain? We need to take an inventory, guys. Write this down with the Holy Spirit. Meditate on it. Put love around your heart and then compare everything in these questions against the garland of love that surrounds your heart. Do we exist with a dull awareness of an emotional ache that we carry around? Does my sense of well-being rise and fall with the level of intimacy that I have with God? Does my self-worth or sense of rest rise and fall with how much or how little I believe I've sinned on that particular day? Does my sense of self-worth rise and fall based upon my actions in any area? Do I feel more or less righteous depending upon how I act or interact on any given moment? Guys, if the answers of those, if our sense of who we are changes, we're at that moment rejecting the word of God that says that we have salvation as a byproduct of being made righteous. And on my website, I have it's loaded with, 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 uh, with, scriptures that allow us to wash our word. They're on there to wash ourselves. The Bible says renew your minds through the watering and the washing of the word. It is our belief system that Satan attacks. And coming from some of my background, very, very well acquainted and engaged with the realm of the spirit. Uh, it's just one of the things that he's from a very young age, from the time I was seven and accepted the Lord. Um, I engaged in, um, Spiritual warfare, I wish I knew now how simple it was. I wish I knew at age seven, but I know now that it's not a pitched battle. The enemy only has what I give him where I empower them with agreement. I wish I understood the name of Jesus Christ and then as a citizen of heaven, I exercise authority over the realm of the demonic. And it's not this uncertain outcome. When God used to speak to me when I was young, um, he would show me things of how to pray for people, car accidents to avoid. He would show me uh, uh, demonic assignments over people's lives, over ministries. And I didn't, under I didn't know any better. I just didn't have any teaching. I thought that God, just like me, was sharing something so that we can wring our hands together and worry. 
I had no idea how big he was. I had no idea his nature. I had no idea the authority and dominion that I have as a redeemed child of God. I didn't know any better. And so growing up, this term spiritual warfare, which really is spiritual slaughter, it eluded me. I didn't understand how to walk it out. And guys, I'm here to tell you, the word makes it very clear that Satan only has a foothold where we agree with our thinking. That's why the epistles, straight through from the gospels to the epistles, says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2 is expressed all throughout the scriptures. So tonight, take a moment, take some time, get alone. Instead of meditating on what you did today or how you could not fall short as much tomorrow or how much you read your Bible, begin to give him permission what areas through our belief systems, where we think about ourselves, contend with the law of love contend with how he sees us. So wrapping it up, guys, and then, and then Frank, I'll turn this back over to you. Recapping, guys, deeper communion begins with understanding his nature, and that his nature is love, is love. The second is that the kingdom of heaven is an extension of his nature. All things flow from his heart. The kingdom of heaven is a real place, It is a real expression, and it is a manifestation. It is a created kingdom that is formed, and its foundations of government sit upon love with Jesus as the ruler. And the third, guys, is that we we need to give him permission to repent. We need to give him permission to show us areas that our thinking has been violating this. Where are we judging others? Where are we angry? Where are we hurt? Where are we... Um, looking for things to take place not out of love and rejoicing over good, but because we're angry and hurt and scared. Guys, this is the beginning of a season that is going to change your life. It will change you. All we have to do is allow it. Let the word sink into your heart. So thank you, Frank. Uh, praise God. I, I hope I didn't go on too long tonight. No, amen. Appreciate it, brother. Uh, you said something the other week on the program that's been really um, wrestling. Well, not wrestling with me. I, I know it and I love it, but I, I've been sharing it a lot, okay? Um, if I've been speaking somewhere or doing something or preaching or whatever, I keep sharing this because it just keeps coming back that – And I think this is the struggle so many people feel like, that Christ, he came and died for us while we were yet sinners. And now that we've messed up, we think God hates us. And it's such a struggle for people. And why would we dare think something like that of our God, who came when we, we hung him on a cross, we didn't care about him, spit on him, everything like that, and and now we made a mistake, and and he would cast us aside. Yeah. What what a horrible. Yeah. I imagine, I imagine how God feels when yeah. he knows what we feel about him. It, it, it breaks his heart, and and you know uh, I'm not going to apologize for being as bold as to say to share what's on Father's heart because we're all meant to flow in that. Um, you know, when we talk about the mysteries of the gospel, the mysteries of Christ, we, we, we say half of the scripture. The mysteries of Christ are revealed in Jesus. The scripture, that's the fulfillment of the scriptures. When we talk about the mysteries of God, Paul goes on every time to say they are in Christ and Christ is in us. The mysteries of God in times past have been shed abroad and revealed through Christ living in us. And one of the areas that we have just refused to accept is that God is not who our parents are or not who our parental figures are or not who the people that we grew up with next to us. We've been taught our whole lives that that our self-worth comes from what other people think and our performance. And so when we accept Christ, we don't change that belief system. We believe there is this one-time grace, this one-time love and act of mercy now that we've, we've been reconciled to God, but we haven't been taught our identity. We really haven't been taught what really took place on the cross. And then we begin to engage in a walk, a spiritual, religious interaction with a God 
that we continue to filter through the lies of this world. And so that's why it perpetuates this fallen belief system, this fallen thinking that God is, his love is limited. His love is, and then we create doctrines and we go into scriptures and we, we misquote out of context different dispensations. And, and, and because it's easier, Frank, and I've been there, and I've been there, it's easier for us to hold on to our own self-righteousness than to believe God truly, truly loves me. Because what if I'm wrong? What if I really, truly don't ever feel his love? And we're scared. We are scared of being disappointed. We are scared that if we give everything up for the sake of the gospel, the good news. Guys, the good news wasn't that Jesus just came. The word gospel, the good news, is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the good news. Jesus says repent. Uh, John the Baptist says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus went around preaching the gospel, guys, think about this. When Jesus went around preaching the gospel, how could he preach the gospel of reconciliation if he hadn't gone to the cross yet? The good news is the kingdom has come to the earth and is about to overthrow the works of sin. What Adam and Eve forfeited 10,000 years ago, or whatever you believe it is, young earth, old earth, whatever, what Adam and Eve forfeited, I am giving back to man which is dominion and rightful position as a child of God. Guys, that is the gospel. And in the gospel is the ministry of reconciliation and righteousness. The gospel is not just salvation. Salvation is the byproduct of the kingdom coming upon the earth and us choosing to accept the gift of righteousness, which gives us salvation. And for many of us, we're afraid to believe that. And that's why it's easier for us to think he's upset with us. And guys, that doesn't please him. That grieves his heart. And when I spend time with him and, and, and we talk, that's one of the things that is on his heart in this hour. He loves you. He sent his son for you. He wants you back. He wants you, not your works. He wants you to get to know him. He wants permission for him to speak to you about the things that are tender on your heart. That's what this series is about, guys, and how we get there. It's a blueprint into the word of God, not my word. So I hope that blesses some people here tonight, Frank, and in the weeks to come. Amen. I am, I'm sure it will. And, and folks, you know, it's so amazing and how good – just truly good and loving your God is, even science shows that believers, people that are believers, that they naturally live longer and are happier. Just, see, even science shows that simply the belief in God, it's like talking with somebody that's an atheist, and you wonder, well, if you're wrong, to the atheist, well, you're going to be in big trouble. But if I'm wrong, I'm going to live longer and be happier. <laughs> so what do you have to lose by being a believer? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, it, and, that, and, and that's just God, just by simply believing in him, you're, that's just one thing out of the gate. You can live a happier life and even get a little bit longer on this earth. Uh, that's just good our God is. And, and, I, I, and, and I know that maybe doesn't sound so huge to some people, but that is massive in this world of turmoil to know that our God wants us to be happier. And I don't know of anything that makes me happier than thinking that Jesus Christ laid his life down for someone like me and he doesn't give up, and he promised to never leave me nor forsake me. Wow. He will be there with me to the very end, and I am so thankful. Even when I mess up, he's there. And he helps me so gently day, 
the Lord is so gracious to us. We certainly are ignorant so often, aren't we, brother? And God just, he, he's so kind. <laughs> I know kind. I am. He's got his hands full with me. I know. He's so kind to us. And so, David, thank you for the word tonight, folks. Be encouraged. This world is so full of turmoil, and nothing will feel better than being at peace, knowing that your God loves you, and he will take care of the problems in your life. You just need to put your trust in him. This is Brother Frank and Brother David on the Remnant Call saying to everyone, good night and shalom. Hey!